As he's admiring his past, like thinking he's all good, I, I laid him out. I'm not kidding you when this kid was knocked out cold and he's laying on the ice and I'm sitting there like, oh my God, what did I do? <laughs> this is day one in Danbury. Please get up, please get up. Like move your hand, <laughs> move your foot. Like, please dude. All of a sudden section 102 starts chanting, body bag. And I'm just thinking, what the f <laughs> What the f are they saying? Are they chanting body? The guy's dead. Like, give him a minute to get up. Like, I was like, holy sh... Like, wh where am I? What's up, everybody? This is AJ Galanti, former president of the original Bad Boys, the Danbury Trashers. Uh, this is Daniel Amesbury, Diamond Hands, uh, the toughest active professional hockey player in the game. If you got a problem, I'll see you at center ice. <laughs> and uh, yeah, here we are, talking trash. <laughs> <laughs> How'd we end up here, man? Uh, I, 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 dude, I don't know. It's like in a world where everyone kind of has a podcast. E even in that world where we live in today, I just never thought I'd have one for you or us as together. It's, it's, it's wild, bro. It is surreal. It's a you want to shout story. out the company we sponsor, basically? Yeah, C4. We're a sponsor of C4. We actually pay the mortgage at the local gas station because we buy so many of these. Uh, yeah. Shout out to AJ. Got the whole gym hooked on him. So, Well, hopefully that, that plug pays dividends. That was a free one plug day. right there. Yeah, but, hopefully uh, one day they can sponsor us. Oh, man. <laughs> so, so here we are, talking trash. It's, it's, it's crazy, man. I mean... Um, it's a long time coming, man. You know, it's just, it's, it's, you know, next year will be 20 years since this Danbury Trasher team and, you know, this Netflix documentary that came out and, um, it's just been a whirlwind, bro. It really, it really, it really has. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, I've always asked people like, when did you hear about the doc or like, when did you personally see it or, or yeah, I mean myself. Yeah. Like I seen it obviously before I'd ever met you. Um, and for me, it, it like struck something emotionally for me. Cause that was kind of the way I was the player I was. And, and, uh, it, it was one of the coolest things when I first seen it, I'm like, man, this is, this is somewhere I should have been like, this is, I should have been doing this, you know? And, and I was so interested in it. So why don't you like break, you know, break it down a little bit. What happened? Like, how did the, how did the doc even come about? What happened? Like when the Netflix what series finally came out, like, how was that for you? Yeah, it was crazy. Cause you know, I I've said in the doc and if, if you know, people watch and haven't seen it, definitely check it out untold crime and penalties. I mean, I've always said like, you know, after we lost the Trashers in 06, I didn't talk about them again. I didn't want to talk about them again. I kind of isolated myself from hockey. You know, it was like a bad breakup, bro. It was it was weird and I just wanted nothing to do with hockey or the Trashers and you know, long story short, you know, we ended up filming this thing with Netflix and um, you know, my dad had just gotten home and it was just it just felt like enough time had gone by to try it, you know, and um kind of get our side of the story too. And um Man, it just, you know, I remember the week before the doc came out, you know, I was with my wife, Kim, and I remember looking at her and saying, I don't even think anyone's even going to even watch this thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and and I really believed that. And my dad believed it. We're like, eh, you know, you know, maybe we'll get 100 views and it'll be all our family type of thing. You know what I mean? And it just, bro, it just shot out. And I mean, everything from kind of like quasi meeting Drake to, you know, talking with the guys at Spitting Chicklets, you know, connecting with Barstool, doing stuff with WWE. I mean, it's crazy just how much stuff came from it. And, uh, you know, that's exactly it. You know, even the podcast, you know, I, I wanted, you know, we as a team, we wanted to take this, you know, momentum from the doc and create something from it. You know, I didn't want to just hang my hat on. Yeah, we got a cool doc and I gave Drake a jersey, and that I didn't want to hang. I know how can we take this momentum and create something even bigger? And um, you know, the 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 legacy lives on, and here we are t talking into Trasher microphone covers. It's it's <laughs> it's insane, dude. It, it really um, it doesn't even make sense to be honest with you. One of the cool things, actually, like just hearing that, I think that's the first time I heard you say, and I didn't even know this. We've spent the last years straight it seems like together but it actually feels long like way longer when you really think it's only really been a year that me and you have been connected and i've, I've been here and maybe here i've been here for a year so we've been connected for a little over that but 
But um, the one thing you just said is how you almost had a breakup with hockey. Yeah. And I had the exact same thing. Yeah. So to hear that, like, that's the first time I really heard yeah. you say that. And it kind of struck something for me. I'm like, wow, because I had the exact same thing. I didn't touch the ice for five years. Yeah. I didn't want to watch a hockey game. I didn't want to go to an NHL game. I didn't want to. I didn't. I had the same breakup. So to see us both go through that and then something brought us back, <laughs> both of us back towards the game. And now we're here together talking about hockey and trashers. and <laughs> Talking trash, and man. What, I, it's crazy. It's cool. It, it's it cool. is. And, and, and that's what I tell people because, you know, you've in a short period of time, not trying to pump your tires, bro, but in a short period of time, I mean, everyone knows who you are. You know, the gym, you're part of our gym, Champs Boxing Club, you, you know, you're a mainstay in, in hockey here and like... It's crazy because um, we have so many similarities. And like you said, it's only really been, if you think about it, under two years we've known each other. And, and um, you know, it's it's just uh, it's crazy how relationships start. It's crazy how stars align. And, and that's what I really gained from the documentary, too, is how many people have similar, you know, everybody's got a different story, but so many stories are so similar. And, and you know, as we've gotten to know each other, there's so many similarities. It's, it's kind of eerie. And, um, you know, I, I guess it's, it's just, it's just one of those things where we'll, we'll see where it goes, but, um, you know, it's, it's just been a crazy ride just for both of us, how we even met, you know yeah. what I mean? And, uh, you know, I, I, people don't know, I mean, um, after the Trasher documentary, you know, like you said, there was so much, so much momentum, so much momentum, things that I could do and. I like to create, as you know, create different things, create cultures, create from scratch and, it's really where we came up with this hockey fighting tournament, you know, King of the Rink. And um, long story short, I remember it was early, what, 2022? I remember when it became official, the King of the Rink hockey fighting tournament. I just remember kind of blasting on social media, hey, we're looking for guys to fight. And uh, it was weird because that King of the Rink tournament we created, it was, it's like all my worlds together, wrestling, hockey, boxing. And it was just, it's just like everything just snowballs and I mean, I, I, why don't you say like how, how did we? How did you find out about this tournament I was throwing? And like, I know how we ended up connecting, <laughs> but how did you like first hear about it? So literally, like uh, that same post you were talking about, I remember one of my friends. Like, I, this is something like the King of the Rink, that fighting hockey fighting tournament is something me and my friends talked about for years because it was just a weird niche skill that I had that never, you know, it got me some pro hockey games, but. You know, I always felt there was more I could do with it, right? And it was always something we talked about. And my buddies always said, man, it's really too bad there isn't just like a hockey fighting league because <laughs> you'd probably be pretty good at that. And then, you know, it always been something we had joked about. And then somebody, one of my friends sent me your post. And it was the first post. It was <laughs> it was before it was even like official official. Uh -huh. You were kind of just throwing out a teaser. And, and you were like, hey, like we're thinking about doing this hockey fighting tournament, king of the rink, uh, you know, this and that. And uh Right away, I'm like licking my chops, man. I'm like, how am I going to get in this thing? And I think I DM the Trashers page. If you go back to our conversation, oh. scroll all the way to the top. I actually was looking at it the other day. I think I sent you 15 messages in a row. Well, the it, it, exactly that because, you know, when this came about, and again, you know, it wasn't just me who created King of the Rink. I kind of took the ball and ran with it. But, you know, our group who started this tournament, I remember when we put it out there, you know, we didn't have, you know, social medias for that league. It was just Danbury Trashers. And, you know, I handle all the social media for myself. So it's like, I remember when I was going to put it out to tease it, I said to myself, man, this is such a cool idea. But, you know, we're in 2022 at the time. I mean, hockey's different. These players, these guys are built different. Is anyone going to want to do this, you know? Same thing with the Netflix. Like, is anyone going to watch it? So I remember immediately, it's like almost as soon as I put it out there, just started getting streams of guys you know it was crazy and and it was, it was just like holy shit i just remember going through dms of guys sending me resumes and and then i saw you you know obviously i saw you and it's just you know i just got inundated and i just you know kind of i'll be honest i skipped over it and just kept going about just you know sometimes you see it sometimes you don't and yeah. it's like sales right you got to keep mm. going and i just remember you kept peppering me bro <laughs> just sending me stuff i need to do this i need to do this i'm gonna win this i'm gonna do it so finally, I'm like, yeah, this Amesbury kid keeps sending me. Let me look into him. And and I felt like I was back as a teenager, you know, scouting for the trashers. I'm like, let me go on his hockey DB, his elite prospects. And um, 
you know, first thing I look for is the PIMS, penalty in minutes. I'm like, wow, he's, okay, he's a tough guy. Go on YouTube. We didn't have YouTube back in the old days, right? So I'm like, oh, I started watching some of these fights. And at first I thought I had the wrong guy because I would see lacrosse videos yeah. and I would see hockey. I'm like, don't tell me this bastard's playing both. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm like, this guy's a maniac. So I remember watching your clips and I was just, I, I swear, Ames, like, it, it's weird how the world works. And I, I felt like I was flashing back to like, 2004, 2005, you're such a throwback fighter. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy would have been a trasher. I'm like, I have to get this guy in this tournament. And um, I remember just hitting you up. You're like, yeah, let's do it. And I, and that's kind of how it, you know, spiraled. And, um, you know, we ended up, it was an eight man tournament. Um, it was back in May of 2022. We went up to Edmonton. That was my first time in Canada, a River Creek casino. Great and place. Love it. Great Loved place. it up there. You know, Edmonton is funny because it's funny, everyone jokes with me. I, I The first time I ever went to Canada was Edmonton. It's, yeah. it's kind of like <clears throat> Western Canada, man. It's blue collar. It's yeah. like tough guys. And I was just like, man, I kind of feel like home. I, I kind of <laughs> like it here. And everyone's like, oh, Edmonton's so dreary. And I'm like, nah, I kind of like it. I, I like Alberta, man. It's just kind of like, the River I don't know. Cree's special too. Like it's its own little culture. Like, I mean, yeah, we were in man. Edmonton, but like it was a cult- Enoch Reserve is kind of cool. It's no, it was a culture shock too. for me. Because yeah. like, it, it, it was a culture shock for me, and I remember going there, and um, it's the first time we physically met, yeah. and I just I just knew right away. You know what I mean? I'm just like, oh, this is a good guy. I mean, all I liked, every single guy that was involved with that tournament, I, I truly liked, and to this day, we still talk. We're all like a family. Everybody, yeah. You think about it, it's yeah. like a family, that king of the ring group, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's... Um, you know, obviously you're closer to some of the others, but I, I just remember before leaving, you know, there's a couple of people back home. Who do you think's going to win? You know, I was like, ah, I, you know, as a, as the promoter, I'm not supposed to have, you know, a horse in the race. I'm like, listen, it, it's a lot of tough guys here. Seriously. I said, but truthfully, my money, you know, I remember saying, I think the finals is going to end up being Amesbury and Derek Parker, which is funny because mm-hmm. that ended up being the first round, round which could have yeah. been the finals, yeah. to be honest. With. I think yeah. that was your toughest fight. Yeah, I think so, too. I remember telling people, oh, God, if I had a gun to my head, I, I'm picking Amesbury. And and, yeah. and everyone's like, oh, he's kind of the smallest of the group. I said, yeah, yeah so what? <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, you know? I mean, I look back at that tournament, and it's like, man, there were some big boys in there. Derek Parker, Justin Sawyer, LaFrance. Corey Allen, Tippin. I mean, um, it, it was unreal. And I just remember, like, just that whole process that weekend, getting to know all the guys. And um, it's weird because it's not hockey, right? It was hockey fights. You know, it wasn't hockey. It was just a weird, just such a weird situation. But that weekend made me kind of just re-fall in love with hockey again because I know that's still part of the culture. Mm-hmm. Whether people want to deny it or not, and I was just like, I want to do more stuff. You know, you know me. I start get rolling, but uh, I think we got a taste of what it was like to be with the boys again too. Because like yeah. for us, like you know, it was it was a special thing for me because you know generally there's maybe one or two fighters on the team, you know, but like being there, it was like wow, it was so cool to be in a hotel. Everybody was staying there, and it wasn't just like you know twenty players. You know, eighteen guys are hockey players, and you got two guys that are kind of tough guys that can play hockey, whatever. But we had. Like, I don't know how many guys, how many fighters was there? Like 60, no, it must have been. That first show we had, let's. 20 fighters maybe? That more. first show we had like 16, like yeah. give or take 16. So like, yeah. you had like a team of tough guys at the hotel. So it was so cool. And like, obviously characters, all these guys are characters in their own ways. So it was fun, man. And we, we all got to, you know, well, that, you battle know, it out. Again, I never played high levels of hockey, right? I mean, I'm I'm a Danbury guy. You know, when I grew up, Danbury didn't even have an arena, you know, most of my life. I got into hockey through watching the Mighty Ducks in the early 90s, right? So it's like, it wasn't, I didn't grow up in hockey culture. And when I got into it with the Trashers and learned, you know, I was just, when I got into hockey, it was the physicality, right? That's what drew me in, okay? My first game I ever went to, New Jersey Devils, Pittsburgh Penguins, it was like 93, 94, Scott Stevens lays out Yarmir Yager. I was hooked. Yes. And what people don't understand is um, that toughness, it's just part, it's ingrained in hockey culture, man. And, and you know, yes, things are different today. There's not technically as much fighting, but it's still part of the game. And like you said, you know, when I got into professional hockey as a GM at 17, 18, you know, I was ignorant to the fact, because I never played pro hockey or anything, 
you know, I thought guys were fighting, hated each other. And yeah. you might have some of that, but they, I learned very quickly the camaraderie amongst the enforcers, right? And I learned that code, right? The enforcers code. Yeah. People don't get that if you're not involved with the sport. You know, growing up again, I was watching guys fighting and I swear, I was like, man, these guys hate each other. They want to kill each other. And yes, in a way, at times, maybe it's like that, but... Sometimes it's at that moment there. It's like that. And then all of a sudden you're upstairs having a beer together. Yeah. Hugs and, and kisses. And, and, and Brad Wingfield, one of the toughest people I've met in my life. Shout Take out it. to Brad Wingfield. Winger, you know, star of uh, our Netflix Had back. to be the toughest trasher ever. Listen, I mean... He's arguably, take hockey out, toughest guy I've ever yeah. met. And, and he pulled me aside. I mean, he I was like a little brother to him, right? I was a 17, 18-year-old kid, and he always respected me as, quote, a boss. But we all knew I was just a young kid trying to figure it out. And he taught me so much about that enforcer code and, and like, all the little nuances to the point where I felt like, like I was an enforcer because I was always drawn to those guys. I yeah. love that part about hockey and the toughness. But I learned, and um, yeah, he was, he was, he was, he is the best man. I, I and, and again, I when we met, I just was like, oh my god, it just reminds me of Wingfield. Like you and him are so similar, and those are the guys, like you said, that camaraderie. The tough guys, nine out of ten times, are the best guys off the ice, and that's the other thing. Like people don't know hockey, are like, oh, these guys are monsters. They got no teeth, and they're beating each other up. Those are the guys you want in the locker room. And that's what people, and that's what I'm hoping we're going to do a lot with this podcast amongst a million other things is kind of show, you know, that that tough guy's not extinct yet. You know, you guys are the last of a dying breed, but it's important because you think about no other sport has guys like you. You know, there's tough guys in every sport, but not, not everyone's built like that. And, and you know, kind of like open the curtain on those old school tough guys and even current ones and, uh, Man, it's it's uh it's I learned so much about life through those trasher days, like, you know, just doing things the right way and, and protecting your teammate. It, it just it's just part of fabric of life, bro, honestly, if you think about it. I think like one of the biggest misconceptions that people have about fighters is like, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's times where we're fighting because we're mad or we're fighting cause for ourselves, cause we're kind of just whatever in the moment, but like for the most part, as a enforcer, a fighter, a heavyweight, whatever you want to call it, if you're the team's protector. So what people don't realize is like that's your character. That's who you are. Generally, if you're the fighter on a team, your character is to be a protector. So that makes you off ice, that's your character. So it's I'm a protector. I love the people around me. I'm I'll do anything. I'll be the first one running through that door for you or for my family or for Anybody that I that might have has a place in my heart, you know what I mean? And people have this misconception because they see kind of how we act sometimes mm -hmm. on the ice and we bark at people and we're like a WWE character, yeah. you know, and and then they just see that and they're like, oh my god, this guy's a monster. <laughs> well when you, really we're just regular Joes, you know. You, like, you hit it on the head and, and that's what I learned. Like those few years, you know, part of running this trasher maniac team we had is like we had so many of those guys right yeah. like you just said like going back to the you know we'll go back to that king of the ring tournament but exactly it, you know it we had so many tough guys and it was like that's what i was used to right and not every team was like that so you had so many characters and and that's why a lot of ex tough guys are the best coaches right now yeah. because they're yeah. their role on the team is to protect and they put the team first not themselves and yeah. that is why some of the, the the best coaches in hockey, period, on any level are either ex-enforcers or ex, you know, those grinders. You know, they yeah. put the team first. And that's why I've always said you're one day you're going to be a great coach because people want to run through the wall for you. You know what I mean? And that's that's what a leader, you know, that's what a leader does, man. And, you know, kind of flashing back now to last year, the King of the Ring tournament, you know, you end up winning. And... um for people that don't know, I mean, it was an eight-man super heavyweight tournament, and uh, you know there were some monsters in there. Eight, eight fighters, so you had to win three. You you ran the table. You won all three. It was two one-minute rounds with a, a thirty-second overtime. If it was a draw after two rounds, and kind of tell me about because I know I analyze this whole thing, but like from your point of view, prepping for this, I remember watching your Instagram leading up to this, and you were doing cold plunges. You were up three in the morning running. I'm like, oh, my God, 
I was like, I know no one else is doing this. And, and that's why I kind of was confident in the fact that I thought you were going to you were gonna be successful in this thing. Yeah, that was honestly the first time in my life as a mature, developed adult. You know, obviously in your early 20s, you're not as smart, but I feel like at this point, this was the first time I was mature enough and I understood this is an opportunity for me. This is something I wanted really bad. I am going to give it 150% every single day, every single minute. And the way I treated that whole camp and the whole preparation, which, which mind you, started the first day I sent you a message. Yeah. It wasn't like, hey, I'm eight weeks out. It's time to start my camp. I didn't even know I was in the thing yet. <laughs> I messaged you. Once I, once I seen you posted it could be something, that's when I started. That's when my camp started. And, you know, I slowly ramped up. But it got to a point where, you know, like I said, I, I, was, I was at the point. I was working on the tugboats, you know, I was, I was working on the logs, running on the logs and, and, uh, on the boat all the time. And then, you know, once that fight finally got locked in and I knew it was coming up, I wasn't working anymore. I was full time. I was yeah. fully committed. Um, and I basically shout out to all the people who supported me and sponsored me during that. Cause it was so helpful. I literally was training every single day, like a dog. Yeah. And it was just one of the things, the, the mentality I had, and I always tell this to the young guys that I coach it's like, you know, if you're training for something, train like the person that you say you're say you're fighting someone, train like the person you're fighting is training right beside you. You know, every time I was doing my sprints and I'm kind of wanting I'm getting tired, yeah. I'm thinking like I'm looking at the treadmill in front of me thinking about Justin Schmidt or whoever yeah. it is I'm going to run into, Parker or whoever, they're running harder than me and I'm like I have to win the fight every single day. Yeah. It's not just one fight at the end. It's I'm fighting every single day. And, and I think that's why I want it, honestly. And, and and listen, you know, in the doc, the documentary never really touched it. And I've, I've been in boxing now 13 years. I mean, which is crazy to think about. I don't have a lot of skills, but one thing I do pride myself on is I have a good eye for guys that have it, you know. We're, we're in a very statistical world. Everything has stats. You know, we're locked into a fan. Thanks for getting me into fantasy hockey, by the way. <laughs> but everything's stats now, right? Analytics, projecting stats. Dude, I'm, I'm old-fashioned. I like the eye test. And I got, like, I'm, I'm not shooting 100%, but I think my shooting percentage is 90-something percent. I, I just know when someone has an it factor. And... and Again, I'm sure we're going to get comments that we're in this, like, love fest right here, but we have to <laughs> intro this whole thing. Like, I knew immediately you had the it factor. And, and again, I was watching you. And I've been in the fight game. And, and I know what it takes. And when I was seeing what you were doing, I'm like, oh, he's on a whole nother level. You know, he's on a whole nother level. And, um, you know, is he going to win it? Maybe. But he's he, he even if he doesn't win it, he's going to. He's going to be the star of this tournament. I just knew it. And um, and not just you, Justice Smoke. I mean, the young yeah. Justice Smoke out of Manitoba, he has there's an some, it factor. There's some dogs, man. There's some dogs. And that's, there. for some reason in my life, I never planned this. I tell people, like, anything I've ever done professionally, I've never planned for it, right? I didn't go to school to be a dentist and you're a dentist or a lawyer. I live in this circus world, bro. Like, I think about it, I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I've gotten myself into some of these things. I just am. And it's like, you know what? I got to do what I got to do. And and you just, it's just like dealing with, like you said, like characters, wrestlers. And um, I love it, man. I don't, I don't know what I would do without that type of lifestyle. And, um, you know, so, so going back to this tournament, you, you end up getting Derek Parker first round, who's a legendary hockey fighter, you know, a legendary enforcer, you know, especially in the minors. And um, he's still going, by the way, I thought I saw I him fight it. last week. I was like, oh my God. I think him and Donald Brashear are both in the league right now. It's, it's insane. It's insane. They got a combined age of but like Derek Parker, eighty something or ninety something. I don't Derek know. Parker is a dog, and and, yeah. and again, people thought this was actually Derek Parker thought, and I love you, Parks, but Derek Parker thought I rigged the. Uh, I remember the lottery, saying that, yeah, yeah, and I didn't. The whole thing was, you know, we for this tournament, we didn't want, you know, uh, we didn't want pre match. Pre matchups in the first round, we were going to do kind of like a lottery system. Now it could have been my fault. I think that people thought we were going to do the lottery like for real at the weigh-in. Really, the lottery happened the night before, and then you know we didn't want to waste time at the weigh-in. We kind of just announced who was going to fight who, but it was a legit lottery. 
And I remember um, it wasn't a New York lottery. No, no, no. <laughs> not New York. My point is, and I try to tell this to Parks because I love him. I said, Parks, I don't. I didn't want you to fight Amesbury first round because in my mind, on my flight to friggin' Edmonton, okay, eating my Timbits, um, I wanted I, you know as a promoter, I would have loved to see that as the finals. You know what I'm saying? You yeah, got the yeah. young. You know, guy, you up and coming lion, and he yeah. is a lion. Oh, you know, it would have been from a promoter standpoint. That's what I would have loved to see in the finals. So, he was a little upset with me. He thought that I kind of. I'm like, dude, you know, even if I did rig it, I can't rig who wins a fight. You and know what I mean? Wouldn't have made sense to put me and Parks if no. you were on the same side. You no, know what I, mean? I would have want wanted you. I would have, yeah. you know, if I really wanted a pre match, I would have wanted you guys to meet in the finals. Because yeah. honestly, in my mind, I was like. I couldn't see anybody beating you. I couldn't really, and and even Parker. I was like, I don't know, man. He may be a little older, but that's a <laughs> that guy's a monster. Yeah, and you guys guy. had an absolute war, and um, you ended up winning. You know, the icebreaker round, the overtime round, mm-hmm. and and I and Parker's a great guy, but he was upset with me. I'm like, Parker, I, I don't know what to tell you, bro. I was like, it just wasn't. You know, it's just the way the cookie crumbles, man. You I, know. I think I still get comments from some of his buddies on my fights. Oh man, he <laughs> still get comments. They're but still that, mad that, about but, it. But uh, you know, then you end up fighting Chase Tip in second round and end up winning the finals. You know, kind of almost as I predicted. I was like, and I just remember um, giving you that crown. And there's a picture of us, and I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I wanna. I think it's in the gym actually. There's a picture of you and me. You got the crown on, the red and black crown. You're looking f- straight, and I'm looking at you <laughs> like I got the biggest crust on you, bro. <laughs> I'm looking at you like a schoolgirl. I know like, exactly the picture. I was like, what about. a star. I just that was knew. Fun, though, I just knew. I was like, this kid, look, I could get into a plane crash on the way home, but this kid is going to be a star. And, 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 you know, we had, you know, a second King of the Ring tournament where it wasn't a tournament for you, but you ended up winning again in the main event. And, um, then you come to Danbury, and 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 kind of how that came about was, you know, obviously, you know, the Danbury hat tricks are the pro team here, you know, li- keeping the Danbury excellence in hockey going, and um, you know, I'm not part of the hat tricks organization, but you know, I've always, I'm always going to support any team that comes to Danbury, and there's been hockey teams that have come to Danbury after us that, you know, they tried their best, but you know, it was kind of chachki, you know, what I mean, mm. but the hat tricks from day one are to me the closest thing to what we did, you know, just organizational wise, just the way things are run. Um, you know, I just, I love the ownership group. I love the team. And and even before you came, I was always going to go and support. I remember John Krupinski, one of the coaches and scouts came up to me and I've known John forever. And I just remember him, you know, saying going into the 22, 23 seasons, like, you know, I need, you know, we need some toughness. What do you think? And I had this database of all these King of the Rink guys and he was coming to me. I'm like, look, like there's a million guys, but you got to get diamond hands. It just makes sense. And and I'll be honest with you, I didn't think it might work out because you know you, you know again you had a nice you know tough job but a nice yeah. job. Yeah. You know you you're in Western Canada. You got a family. You got two beautiful kids. You got all your family there. I said, man, it would be great to have Amesbury and Danbury. It just it's a legacy thing. But I don't. Th- I honestly I didn't think you would come. I'm like, there's no way he's gonna uproot and come all the way here, leave his job. Good paid job, because I, I know what you were doing. <laughs> um, you know, great paying job. And, and I was like, I just can't see it. And then plus with guys, you don't know how the wife's gonna feel, right? So I don't know your wife. Your wife is a sweetheart. I love her, but I didn't know her, know her at the time. I'm like, there's no way. Even if he wanted to, there's no way Jamie's gonna let him come or yeah. and sure enough, I remember you text me like the next day. You're like, hey, I'm coming to Danbury. I'm like, holy <laughs> shit, what? So kind of tell me like how how do you remember kind of I guess getting approached to to come over here. Yeah, I remember when it first happened. I think I talked to Kerpinski first. I think it was a Facebook message, and then um, you know, like when it first happened, I had the conversation with Jamie, and and you know, at first it was like there's no possible way, but we kind of like fan. It was kind of like a fantasy thing, like oh, this would be cool. And at this point, I had you know, I just won Ice Wars. I was buzzing. I was feeling really confident in myself. I was really feeling like I could have done something. Mm-hmm. I can do something more. This is my second kick at the can. I retired from pro hockey in 2014. This is, you know, I, I think I can do something big. I think there's something big around the horizon. And 
you know, the conversation started and, and, uh, you know, like I said, I was making good money working on the tugboats back home. And I just obviously had been there my whole life. So, you know, I, I knew everybody, you know, um, back home. So it was, you know, it was a comfortable place for me to be, but, um, you know, the conversations happened and as time went on, the conversation started getting a little more serious and we kind of started to think about it. <laughs> and then I got a call from coach Bill, Mc, Billy McCreary and, uh, you know, we start talking and then it really just came down to like crunching the numbers and seeing like, it, are we going to be able to make this happen? It's a sacrifice. If mm -hmm. we do it, we kind of had this understanding and I'm so lucky to have Jamie cause she's so supportive and stuff like this to uproot my whole family and move them across the country. I think it's like a 48 hour drive <laughs> and, uh, to do that and have somebody support me because she believes in me. It was super rad. And, uh, yeah, we kind of just got to the point where she believed in me, I believed in me, and I was like, we're going to do something big. And um, and then, yeah, we just basically made it happen, made the move. And it was, like I said, like, if I always say this to people too, it's like when there's something you love, like, you got to sacrifice for it. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't just get things without making some sort of sacrifice. And and I sacrificed a lot by, you know, we're, I don't get to see my parents all the time. I don't get to see a lot of my family and friends. And we came here, but all that sacrifice is going to create the reward more in the end. And, and now, you know, me and you are sitting here building this crazy thing that we have going on. We've created a team, you know, I'm over with Ch you at Champs and, and, you know, I'm boxing and, and obviously playing in Danbury and, and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, even, even if it all ended tomorrow... I'd be so grateful I came, which I know it's not going to because we're just getting started, obviously, as you can see in the Talking Trash podcast. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's exactly it, man. It's like, you know, you said something earlier, you know, this episode, you said, you know, talking about king of the ring and you're like, I'm at a point in my life where I'm mentally mature enough. It's a great thing that we're both mentally mature enough to be together because I, I always think like, had the trashers gone on, you and I would have crossed paths at some point as young 20 year old kids and yeah. if we didn't get kicked out of the league the first two years <laughs> and there was a good shot if we were to ever you know cross paths oh man it would have been bad so it's funny because you know we're i'm 37 now it's yeah. it's crazy like every day the past two years i'm seeing pictures of me as a 17 year old kid and i'm like man i got old and it's just like it's great to know that we connected when we did because oh Lord knows what would have happened if, if we met, no, met earlier yeah, probably on. probably would have been bad. Yeah. And I probably, listen, I'm not a professional host here, but we probably should have started, like, when did you start playing hockey? Like, like when did you, I mean, when did you go pro and, and you know, talk a little bit about before you retired that first time? Yeah, so, like, I mean, I obviously started as a kid in Canada. Like, I started at a young age and kind of grew up, and I was never, like, full-time hockey. I never played spring hockey. I wasn't ever, like... My dad wasn't like super crazy pushing me in hockey. My dad actually was more of a baseball guy and it was baseball in the summer and, and hockey in the winter. And, and that was kind of what it was. And, and as I got older, I got into junior hockey. I wanted to play for the local junior team. I was kind of like, to me, that was like playing in the NHL because I watched this team from when I was a kid. And then, um, I ended up getting to a tryout and I was kind of on the bubble. Didn't quite, probably wouldn't really have made it. Uh, and I just went and I fought a guy and it went really well. I think the guy was 21. I might've been 16 or 17, <laughs> I think probably 17. And, and I did really well. And I remember thinking like, Oh no, am I going to get in trouble for that? Cause like I was in minor hockey. So every time I fought, I'd get in trouble. Cause like you get suspended cause we'd have, have to rip our helmets off and stuff. And I'm in the dressing room. I remember one of the assistant coaches comes barreling in and he's like, yeah. And he's like cheering. He's like, that was awesome. We didn't know you could do that. And he basically offered me a contract right there. So that was kind of what opened the doors for the fighting. And obviously that grew and blossomed into kind of getting that role as an enforcer. And then um, played my first pro season, I think in, uh, I want to say 2011 or 2011, 2012 or 2012, 2013, one of the two started in the FHL. Um, started in Vermont. I will, I can tell you a million crazy stories about that. <laughs> uh, ended up in the SPHL with Columbus, won a championship down there. And then, you know, played in the central league, which was, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of teams in the oh, central yeah. league that, that were in the league with you guys, I think maybe, um, in your IHL days, I believe. UHL. UHL but you're days. right. Yeah, a yeah. Lot, when the UHL, one of those teams, you know, when the U A when the UHL had, you know, disbanded, you know, years after we left, I think they ended up in the central. I could yeah, be wrong. I, I think some of the teams crossed over, but either way. Yeah. So then 
Uh, and then I ended up, you know, uh, life happens. I ended up retiring in 2014, going back home. And that was kind of, there was a little bit of crossover between box lacrosse. There was a point in my, my life where I was literally fighting year round. <laughs> I was like fighting all winter in a hockey. And then I'd go home, play lacrosse, <laughs> fight all summer. And then, you know, and it's, this is like bare knuckle fighting, you know, yeah. I don't know how my hands handled it, but, um, I ended up you know, doing the lacrosse thing for, you know, I guess it was the last nine years. Yeah. And then now here I am, out of, came out of retirement last year, won another championship, got it, uh, got a new ring <laughs> I wear on my neck because it, because it's too big for my hand. Yeah, man. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so I'm kind of back into it and here I am and, second year. And yeah, I mean, again, after, you know, I kind of told Kropinski and the guys that uh, at the hat trucks, I'm like, look, you, if you're going to go to, for someone it's Amesbury, and then, you know, I got some other guys, too, that would be good, but Amesbury's your target. And then when he, I remember when you tell me, I was like, I couldn't believe it. And um, I was just like, man, this is a wild man. But, to, you know, like I said, all the sacrifice, and um, here we are. And then, yeah. I, you know, my, my, you know, you talk about character, like, all of a sudden, I'm thinking, like, how can I help, like, when you get here? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it can't just be you come here and just put, so... It's been amazing. You know, to you, be here. you you come. You know, I own Champs Boxing Club. We have a you know great team over there, and I just I knew you were gonna fit in. But I mean, you're coming in. You're boxing now, and then you want to box, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy is. You know, you're a fighter, man, and and that's what people don't understand. Like people used to say, like, how did you choose guys for the trashers to fight? You know, there are ways to scout a fighter, right? There, there, there. There's what I try to explain to people is in the early 2000s and the 90s and you know, you know, there was guys that made the team because they fought, you know what I mean? And a lot of guys didn't, I'd say 90% of the guys didn't really want to fight. It's just, that's how they stuck. Right. Yeah. I tried to find the 10% that liked to fight. Okay. The weirdos. Bre <laughs> big weirdos. And just guys like Brad Wingfield. Yeah. He got a sick satisfaction. I like, he, he was a great fighter, but he liked it. John Marasti, another guy, um, you know, legendary hockey fighter, but he, you know, liked it like i remember him telling me like he would know his ranking on these fantasy sites like pound for pound ratings which is all bullshit but he would know what people thought i mean room in the dirt um just you know frank by lois we had the animal you know i mean we had guys and then when i meet you years down the line i'm like it's like scouting it's like riding a bike it's like man this guy loves to fight and again it sounds crazy to people, like, how do you like to fight? But some guys, if you're a fighter in life, whether it's physically, you know, a job or in life, like, I consider myself a fighter. I'm not actually fighting, but when you're a fighter, it's just, you're just drawn to it. You know what I mean? Like, you, you got to fight for it in life. And that's what I try to explain to people. So you either, there's doers and there's viewers. There's The doers are the guys are going to fight for it no matter what. And, and there's, you know, literally, figuratively, however, and, uh, you know, so you get to Danbury, you're in the gym, now you want to, you, the team's doing great. And to this day, I say you were, you know, you do the things, guys like you do the things that don't show up in the stat sheet. I'm a firm believer, and there's a lot of people agree with me, that if you're not on that team last year, I don't know if they win it all. And that's not a knock, that's just the truth. There's, you need, you know, you can't have a, you can't have a basketball team with all centers. And I try to tell people, if you want to develop a team, you have to have these roles. And I tell people to this day, Ames is a major reason why. I mean, he didn't have 30 goals, 50 assists, but you're a major reason why. And and if you look at successful teams, guys who win the NHL, um, you got these sandpaper guys. That's that's who wins. You know, yeah. those are guys who are going to get you there. So when you win a championship or when you get to that like point where you're playing at that level, I really truly believe if you just take one single guy out of the room, yeah, it could totally affect the whole result even if it is a guy that doesn't score a single goal you could have taken any guy out of that room that we had last year any one guy and it could have thrown the whole thing off because that, because just the the bond that we had and just everybody having their roles and everybody knowing exactly what they had to do it's like literally you take one guy out of that room anybody and potentially we don't win that so. it, it's so true i mean we'll get to it in other episodes but like you know people ask me like building the trashers right and there was such a difference between the first there's such a difference between the two teams because people they watch the documentary they do research they think it was like one season to, you know but there was two seasons and we were always the bad boys of hockey but there was definitely a difference between the two teams and, and that came from experience learning like you said like how to really build 
the perfect team. And we were almost perfect that second year. We 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 missed out in the finals, but um, you know, so you're in Danbury and I guess, you know, this culture, this Danbury hockey culture that started in, in 04, right? I mean, my dad had this vision. And again, you know, I probably should have started this, you know, without my father, didn't, you know, without my father, we're not here. You yes, know what I mean? 100%. Like, like without my yeah. father, this isn't possible. So, yeah. you know, so many things come from decisions made, you know, and, and uh, you know, we. Uh, cre- uh, one of the things, too, are just going off of like your father and like coming here. He is literally one of the sweetest, like, like yeah. best people I've ever met in my life. Like, yeah. he makes me feel, like, yeah. so warm inside when I see him. He's a, such a good dude. He's like, old, old so school. So grateful to have your dad and yeah, you in and, my life. Yeah, and, so. and again, you know, you're a type of guy too. My dad gravitates to you know real. You know, people know authenticity, right? Yeah. Like, people know who's real, who's not, and uh, you know. So again, you know, my dad had this vision, and you know, we cultivated it, and. You know, I'm very proud of hockey continuing. You know, the Hattrick's got a great organization. We got a pro team in town. We got a, two junior teams in yeah. town. And we're just going to keep building. And I say we because it's a family. You know what I mean? Whether you're getting paid or not, if you're part of this, you know, family, you're a family. So you come to Danbury and, and it's it's always been known as like a tough city, especially for visiting teams. And fans are thirsty for, you know, we want to win, but. There's that there's that thirst for violence and um, you know I remember when you came I'm like oh man I was like I wonder I wonder what game it's gonna be where Ames gets baptized into Danbury hockey and and I and we know why don't you tell everyone like when you finally you had that baptism and it's like okay he's a Danbury hockey player yeah it didn't take very long did it no not <laughs> so, at all so it was game one. Uh, Game one, I, I, I don't remember much about the game besides this one particular event. I think there was eight seconds left in the game. I think we were up like 6-2. Like, we were winning, but I, like you, like you, I think you said it before, like, I'm an old school guy. Like, I, I just play the game an old school way. I don't care if there's eight seconds left. I don't care what the score is. We're playing in between the whistles. Mm-hmm. Keep your damn head up. Like, I literally don't, just, I, you know what I mean? That's just how I play. Like, you know, in today's NHL, a guy's probably not going to lay someone out with five seconds left if they're, you know, if they're killing a team or whatever. But old NHL, that's happening every time. Like, that's just old school hockey. It's like, hey, keep your head up. It's in between the whistles. That's how I was raised. So eight seconds left in the game. Probably could have spared this kid, <laughs> but I didn't. Uh, he, you know, puck goes D to D. He kind of t- makes a pass. And, and, and as he's admiring his pass, like, thinking he's all good. I, I laid him out. And it was a super clean check, by the way. It was right in front of the ref. And I talked to the ref after the game. There was no penalty on the play. The ref said it was clean as a whistle. But, you know, today's hockey, it was mm. just too big of a hit. And the kid got hurt. Thank God he's okay now. But I'm not kidding you when this kid was knocked out cold and he's laying on the ice and I'm sitting there like, oh, my God, what did I do? (laughs) This is day one in Danbury. And I'm like, I should probably pray. Like, I'm not like, you know, the most religious guy or anything, but I'm like, let's let's say some words for this guy. Like, let's let's hope to God this guy gets up and he's okay. Like, I don't want him to get hurt. I've been rocked before. Like, so I'm on one one knee with my head down. You can watch the video. And I'm like thinking like. Please get up. Please get up. Like, move your hand. <laughs> move your foot. Like, please, dude. And uh, all of a sudden, Section 102 starts chanting, Body bag. Body bag. Body bag. And I'm just thinking, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck are they saying? Are they chanting body? The guy's dead. Like, give him a minute to get up. Like, I was like, holy sh... Like, wh- where am I? <laughs> So uh, welcome that, to hell, but that, that was uh, that was my introduction to Danbury hockey, and uh, I'm gonna be honest, I wouldn't have it any other way. I uh, I I love playing in the Danbury Ice Arena. There's something super special, but uh, yeah, man, I would not want to be on a visiting team in Danbury ever. So it, <laughs> getting back to getting back to that amazing analysis. I remember before your first game, and it was the first home game, and I remember you were at the gym, and we were talking. I wasn't going to be able to make the first game, unfortunately, and, uh, you know, not that you need a lesson or anything, but I remember talking to you and be like, hey, you know, you're new, you have a rep, just, 
you know, do what you got to do, but they're going to be watching you. You know what I mean? And I remember Dave McDonough, Coach Dave was with us and we're talking to you and, and, uh, no, no, I'm, I remember you. No, 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 I'm going to play it straight. I don't even think I'm going to drop the glove. I'm not going to do anything tonight. I just want to, you know, kind of get acclimated and this and that. Play some hockey. Yeah, play some hockey. I get home and I'm like, oh shit, let me look at the box score. And it's like, <laughs> even though you didn't get a penalty during the game, after the game is when they decided to. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, you got suspended, I think, right? Did you get I suspended? I got one game on game one. And one I was just like, suspension. what did he do? I go on Facebook and it's pictures all over. And you just, and again, clean hit. Uh, I just, I remember laughing so hard. And, and um, I, I remember seeing you on your knee. And Section 102, for, who, for those who don't know, if you've seen the documentary, the greatest fans on earth are directly behind the visitor's bench. And uh, I just took a little bit of pride knowing that I played a small part in getting you here. And yeah. that was kind of like, and and that's what this was like giving, you know, after the doc, I'm like, how do I give back to Danbury? How do I give back to the hockey community? And I really felt a sense of pride. Like <laughs> I did a small part in bringing you here. And oh, you did a big is, part. You this is giving part. back to those 102 guys that were the most loyal fans to us. And from that point on, I mean, you talk about just, Love at first sight. They just love you. And, and it's like, listen, we got so much to talk about. I mean, you know, for those who, who are going to tune in, make sure you like and subscribe this episode. We have so much stuff. We're miking you up most of this season. Oh, yeah, I'll be mic'd up. All We're going to analyze yeah. this, yes. the fights, and, and not just hockey, lacrosse, all sports. It's, it's the Talking Trash podcast. We talk trash about anything. Yeah. And trash isn't always necessarily a bad thing. We're just going to talk um, – you know, sports, we're going to review a bunch of stuff. I mean, uh, trasher stories. Everyone wants more trasher stories. I do have some more trasher stories. Um, and this is out of my comfort zone, believe it or not, because I'm not one to just put myself out there. I know it doesn't seem like that. We had a documentary and stuff, but there are some trasher stories. I'm old school that are going to remain sacred and not spoken about. But there are a lot that weren't covered before, uh, bringing in some guests. It's, it's going to be... It's going to be a ride, man. I wouldn't want to do it with anyone else. I mean, we we have so much stuff to talk about. And so many people ask me, Ames, like, when you were a kid, I was a teenager in college. Like, when you were running, you know, doing your part running the team, you know, what was the road like? I didn't go on the road because I was a kid and my mom wouldn't let me. You know, <laughs> I'm the only GM in pro sports history that their mother dictated whether they could go on the road or not. I went on one, two road games. And I got kicked out of the press box in Elmira the first ever time I went to a road game. Is that the Jackals? Or? Elmira Jackals. Yeah, yeah. The, sec the second game of our franchise history. We played our first game at home. The second one was in Elmira. I didn't know how to act in the media box. I was talking. They kicked me out. <laughs> so I didn't go on road trips. But I know you've been on road trips, and that's what a lot of people don't know, just the stuff that goes on the road, especially with hockey guys, because I've heard stories, but... I know you got some stories too. Oh, allegedly, allegedly. I, of course, it's always allegedly. I know you allegedly have some good ones. Allegedly, there's a couple stories. <laughs> One might include uh, maybe a stolen cop car and possibly a flaming <laughs> bus, but these are all alleged, <laughs> alleged stories. We're not even sure, so uh, we'll oh, get man. into those uh, and, and, one of the next episodes. And obviously, we got to get into you know, kind of what we've accomplished just as a team together in the short while. Getting into rough and rowdy with Barstool, going over. I mean. It looks like you might be back in action with Barstool in January. Uh, there's so much to talk about. Guys, make sure you like, subscribe. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, but I promise you, the Talking Trash podcast, you, this is this is the one, guys. This is the one. Um, looking forward to it, brother. I'm stoked. Wouldn't rather do it than anyone else. So Follow us at DB Trashers, at Ames to Barry. Ames we'll, put to it, we'll put it on there, and uh, we got a lot of stuff coming. So thank you all for the support.